I love y'all so much. Thank you. You can be seated. And for those online and those here, happy Father's Day to the greatest father ever, our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we were in prayer time this morning at 7. You know, we have it every day at 7. And what's amazing is that when we do this prayer time is, uh, you know, we, we even talked about Father's Day. Now, here's, here's why Father's Day is kind of weird for some people. Obviously, there are people that grew up in a, a bad home, didn't have a good father, didn't have a good home life, um, financial situations were terrible, um, maybe there was abuse, all kinds of things. And people will look at me. And I know, uh, you know, this happens to a lot of us as pastors, and, and people look at, I mean, Seth, people say this to your dad. Uh, you know, Pastor Nick sees us uh, all the time, and Pastor Christian, Pastor Zach, and Pastor Ron, and on and on and on and on, and, and uh, Pastor Steve. And, and people see this all the time, and they'll say, oh, if God is so good, why did this happen to me? Right? That's the, that's the argument called the problem of evil and greater good theodicy people use and other things. Here's what I want you to know. Here's why we have a good, good father. Because it's not so much what has happened to us that's the power, but where God is going to take us from, that is the power. In other words, what's coming is good. He rescued us from this body of death. He rescued us from sin. He rescued us from being enemies with him. Isn't that what it says in Romans? How about this? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not where we were. It's where we're going because in Christ, that's what's good. So you come back with that statement and say, let me tell you what, even though you might not have an earthly father and everything might have been jank and everything might have been ratchet, I just want you to know this, that God is coming back and he's already shown himself in Jesus and he will change what nobody else can change, even our dead hearts to life. Come on, that is good news for some people that really want to know, is there a good father? So, where we're going today is in Hebrews chapter 2, starting verse 14. But we know the key is in all of the book of Hebrews, because we're looking for a Kairos moment, every one of us. We're looking for a divine appointment, a divine opportunity. Hebrews 6 tells us in verse 1, the whole purpose of Hebrews. He wants us to become spiritually mature. He says, in fact, and you can look at verse 2, and you can look at verse 3, he says, we're not even going to talk about baptism. We're not going to talk about repentance from sin. Or we're not going to talk about eternal life. We're not going to talk about the laying on of hands. We are going to get down to the nuts and bolts of what it is to be a Christian and be a mature Christian and why. Because you and I all know that people don't read the Bible. I said all the time, I said every week, so it becomes a memory to us. Y'all know the teaching method of that. You know the uh, pedagogical method. Uh, I say it every week. People don't read the Bible. They just read who? Us who what? There you go. But what they're looking for is they're looking for maturity. Hebrews 6, 1. The centerpiece of it all, even though we're going to Hebrews Chapter 2, verse 14. They're looking for maturity. They're looking for this Holy Spirit filled, anointed. There has to be a difference from people who say the Word of God than people who are transformed by the Word of God. Can I get a witness? Has to be a difference. So when there's maturity in our lives, there's transformation in our life. And God could do more with us in this room than he could do with 5,000 people who just come to worship on a Sunday and maybe bring their Bible on a phone or with them. And, and, and God is nothing but compartmentalized. I want you to know today that God isn't going to share your life. God is your life. So, what's one way we can show people Maturity. I love, of course, like, well, Nick Ballinger's addicted to him, and we've gone through therapy for him for that. But uh, C.S. Lewis, and 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 I do love C.S. Lewis. You, you really, I, one of my favorite ones is the problem, uh, you know, uh, of, of evil. And um, 
and uh, the great divorce. Love the great divorce. And uh, but C.S. Lewis is obviously a guy people in Christendom look to, and we read because he's heady and he led Tolkien to the Lord. No, Tolkien led him to the Lord, and um, you know Lord of the Rings and those type of things. That's all Christian undertones. But let me just say this: I love the movie when my kids were growing up. I love the movie when it came out. You know, in early early 2000s, you know, 90s was like this introduced introduction of contemporary music was coming all flow, right? We were like all in. And, you know, in the 80s, we had Carmen. We had Carmen. <laughs> you know, and he would have those videos, and everybody was like, it was really corny, and it was really hilarious. I mean, Kevin's like, where are we going with that? I mean, but it's like just like Carmen got me fired up. You know, I was like, yeah, let's go. And, and then, then you had some then hard rock groups, right? And then you had Striper. My favorite song, To Hell with the Devil. <laughs> Woo! YouTube it. It's awesome. They would throw Bibles at their concert. <laughs> People throwing beer at one, they were throwing Bibles. And then in the 90s, it was this big contemporary push. And then, and then in the early 2000s, we, we started, oh, we started, oh, man, really, we don't have to be afraid of the arts. We should own the arts because God is the one who created art, right? He's the one who created imagination in Genesis 2. I mean, uh, Adam gets to look at a big old thing and say, elephant. I might not have named him elephant. I might have said, that's something else. But anyway, you get this creativity in the garden. And we started getting movies. And so then they make a, a movie by C.S. Lewis. They play off of him on the lion, the witch, and the... The lion, the witch, and the... Yeah, my favorite scene is when that young guy, Peter, he's kind of the leader of the... the, 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 the his, you know, his sisters and his brother Edmund, who sinned, right? Who, you know, sinned and got stuck with the witch who was representing the devil. And, and if you go, you should YouTube it. It's only like three and a half minutes long. It's so cool. And all of a sudden, he, he sees that witch who represents Satan. And, and, and you know, and they call him, they call him son of man, right? Son of Adam the whole time. And all of a sudden, there's this fight between this guy named Peter, right? And uh, I think of Peter in scripture, this young kid. And this like witch who represents she represents Satan, and, and, and they're like battling it out, right? And they're battling it, and all of a sudden, the witch just beats down the son of Adam called Peter, this kid. And she stabs the sword right here in his armor, so he's trapped. She's getting ready to kill him, and all of a sudden, the hero of the story shows up, the lion, Aslam, right? What a cool name to name your kid, by the way. And all of a sudden, he shows up, and he, he just he, he jumps on top of her and devours her. Just when we think it's all over, Jesus shows up. And I mean, I'm like, every time I see it, I want to cry, and then I want to start punching my computer because I'm like so into it. Let's go. I want to do CrossFit, so I grab yeast rolls, and I go into a full thruster and right in my mouth. That was for certain CrossFit people out front here who I love, who have their heads down saying, don't embarrass me, John. That's my favorite part. Because here's what I want you to know today. There, a Kairos moment is a point from where we go from feeling devoured to Holy Spirit empowered. If you're looking for a pithy statement, if you're looking for the main idea, here it is. A divine appointment, a point where we can become spiritually mature today. If you're looking for a place today to encounter Jesus Christ and God is, man, I told I had Holy Ghost goosebumps, you know, and we were in our young pro uh, uh, class at 10 o'clock, and I'm over there, I got, got, didn't I say, I got Holy Spirit, man, I just the power of this passage. Jesus Christ will allow you to feel devoured but then he'll come in like a flood and the Holy Spirit will empower. There will be moments where there is no other option and it looks like it is absolutely over and the gates of hell are here and fiery arrows from the enemy are coming at you and you are on your back and you feel totally trapped like Peter in that movie and you feel like Satan 
is getting ready to take his final blow on you and all of a sudden the king of kings and lord of lords shows up somebody and devours you might feel devoured but the holy spirit will empower this is our divine moment let's pray father in the name of jesus i don't want to come with wise and persuasive words but i want to come with a demonstration of the spirit and a power so that everybody online and everybody here their faith would not rest on human wisdom but on the spirit and a power so lord i ask that you transform us today you have taken out for those that are born again sanctified holy ghost filled you have taken out our heart of stone you have performed heart surgery like Jeremiah 18 where you are the potter and we are the clay and you take our clay bodies and you mash us all the way down till we feel like we've lost everything and then you build us up into this bright shining light for Jesus and that light ebbs and flows from Ezekiel that says that this heart of stone that you have now given us this heart of flesh in Ezekiel 11 and 16 and on. And you've put your word in our heart. We know that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and raised our dead spirit to life. And when the word of God and the Holy Spirit meet, there is a Holy Ghost, heavenly, Trinitarian filled fire within us. And I pray that my tongue will be that. I pray that I will have tongues of fire today. And that we will have tongues of fire. Like in Acts 2. Because Revelation 1 says when the sword comes out of Jesus' mouth, Philippians 2 says every knee will bow. So we come today, blood bought, Holy Ghost filled, hearts made new. Minds transformed by the gospel. And so, Lord, today, I pray that you would fill us. And on this Father's Day, may we look to the, to the Father. Because no one is good except God alone, Jesus said. So here we go. We go into your word by faith. We ask for this power and anointing. And God, we pray today that you would be glorified, saints edified, Satan horrified. It's all in the name of Jesus, all by the blood of Jesus. And all God's people said, what? Amen and amen, Hebrews chapter 2. Woo! You smell what Jesus is cooking. Kairos moments move us from feeling devoured to Holy Spirit empowered. Feeling devoured, Holy Spirit empowered. Feeling devoured, Holy Spirit empowered. That's the mark of maturity. That's what God wants because God is going to answer our prayer in Matthew that he says the field is white with harvest, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. We are his workers we are his workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2. Poel, where we get poetry, we are his poem to be read by all men. And so now we, who are Holy Ghost filled, now we move into places. And we, people are looking for what is different about us. Yes, we celebrate Juneteenth. Yes, we celebrate freedom. But we don't move into false teaching and false doctrine. We stay with Jesus. We celebrate the one who's going. We're going to see free, freedom in here. We'll see this. But what people are looking today for mature believers. They're looking for believers who say what they mean and mean what they say. And that's why God has called us to divine appointment in Hebrews. Chapter 14. Since the children have flesh and what, saints? That's important. He, meaning Jesus, he too shared in their humanity. How great a love is this? That God wants us in a relationship with him, but our sin stands against the holiness of God. God is love. Love is not love. 
We talked about that last week. That is a lie. That is a lie. That is a lie. Love is not love. Love doesn't define love. Moral subjectivity doesn't define love. God does. So, he loves us so much that the very word of God, Greek, right, logos, stepped into humanity and veiled some of his divinity. He veiled when they asked him, when's the end of times? Only the Father knows. He veiled that he could not be at all place and all times for all people. He was in one place at one time for these people, for them to spread the gospel. That's why he said in his word that greater works we will do. What's the greater work? That we get to share the gospel all over when he couldn't. He comes in love and did for us what we could not do ourselves. Live a perfect life because that is what hinders us from a perfect God. God is love, but he is also holy. And every knee will bow, and we should bow. He is a holy, holy God that we should lovingly, in a biblical fearing way, worship him and let my words be healed. He is otherness. There is no one like him. He is not just a earthly king. He is not just a Milky Way king. He is the king over all the universi, which is right, plural for universe, everywhere, and nothing can contain him. He is so holy that to be in his presence to be in his presence, his, his, there is a fire that goes before his throne. And it is not a fire that you see at a campfire. It is like such a white, pure fire that it looks like a rainbow sea of glass. Scripture says in front of the God, our Father. He is so magnified and so glorified that there are heavenly creatures. There are cherubim. That, are, that, are, that show all of creation together, worshiping him, crying out day and night and night and day, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty who reigns forevermore. King of kings and Lord of lords. He is so other that for us to even look his way, we would be absolutely, as Isaiah said, ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. And if you know Hebrew, that word, that word ruin means to spontaneously combust. That's the God of the universe. The God who is so other that he lives, as Scripture says, in unapproachable light. The purity of who he is. The transformation power of who, who he is. The very word that he speaks that can take all of dark energy and all of dark matter, call this universe that they don't even understand while each galaxy is oscillating and flying away from one another. When gravity said they should be colliding, they don't even understand why. And yet this God said, I will love my people individually. The only way to do it is I got to go to them. So the word of God, and he's not a human. He doesn't have a mouth like we have. Oh, I know. Moses saw him face to face. In Hebrew, that means God spoke to him mouth to mouth. He is not like anyone else. That is why when he appeared, he was so holy and so pure. He's so wonderful that when he appeared in front of Moses, all Moses could see the backside. All Moses could see was his glory. Why? Because Jesus Christ had not come yet. And Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This is the God that we're dealing with. This is the otherness. There's not a weight he cannot lift. There is not a storm he cannot still. 
There is not a crying child he cannot hold. And there is not a sin he cannot forgive. But it has to be him who does it. And that's what he did for you and me. And that word became flesh and said, I will bear the weight of John Davis. I will bear the weight of Kevin Chafin. I will bear the weight of Ron and Marsha and Nick and Brandy and Julian and Brittany and the I will wear it all. Scott and Dave, I will wear it all. And he bore the wrath of God. Why? So we can have a relationship to the one who lives. You read what it says in unapproachable light. The Psalm 97 says, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, right? Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Why? Because he's angry and he's violent? No, it's our protection. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth, the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples will see his glory. That's the God you're dealing with. And Jesus, his word, puts on humanity. Weakness. And you know we're weak. So that we now, through Jesus, can approach the unapproachable light. The ancient of days, Daniel 7 calls God. And so, Hebrews 4 will tell us that we can come boldly, that's what the Word says, to the throne of grace, to receive grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. That's who Jesus is. But why are Christians... Why is there such this immaturity? Why are we even arguing about progressive Christianity? God is not progressive. Jesus is not progressive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change, will not change. He's not a man that he should lie. This is the God we're dealing with and who so lovingly wants a relationship with you, so lovingly knows that the best thing in our life is surrendering our lives to him. So that then there's this transformation within us that we become more enthralled and he becomes our treasure. We live out a life for him and we don't care what happens to us. Oh, I love Fox's books of Mar Book of Martyrs. I love reading about. That's why I was enthralled with church history. Because all I really cared about was not so much about the doctrines they were fighting, but who are these women and men that would give their lives and would look at me today and say, you're soft, John. And I'd say, yes, I eat golden crow. That is who we're dealing with. And a divine Kairos appointment with him brings such from going from feeling devoured to feeling empowered. But how do we feel devoured? Oh, Jesus knew the heart of every scared person. I'm not scared. what people say I know I'm speaking from subjective experience and it's ill it's intellectual dishonesty for me to take my subjective world and speak as it as if it is objective truth nobody's personal experience online or here is the authority you might have experienced something horrific but that doesn't mean everybody else has or that it's even universal when my wife was attacked by two minorities at Temple University to try to rape her, does that mean that everybody like that is bad? Absolutely not. Those people were in sin. And they will be held accountable as individuals in that sin. It's intellectual dishonesty to superimpose a personal experience as if all of life is that. Only God gets that right. What is our greatest fear? There are some things 
that apply to every one of us, and it is fear. From being a newborn, there is fear. Fear of falling. Is that correct? Am I right with that? There's something broken. Verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might what, saints? I didn't hear you. His, his, he might what? Here's where spiritual maturity can be seen by anybody and everybody, regardless of your Bible knowledge. You don't have to be like Nick Ballinger in your Ph.D. in ecclesiology and super smart and read 8,000 books and have a photographic memory, in my opinion. And then there's people like me who are pinto beans and cornbread who struggle with Bob the Tomato. That's why he takes foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Everybody in this room, let's meet our fear. Everybody online, let's meet our fear. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, how great is this God, that by the death of Jesus, he might break the power of, of him, who is him, the devil is going to explain it, him who holds the power of what? The power of, that is, the devil. The devil holds the power of death. Verse 15, feeling devoured to Holy Spirit empowered. Here's where it happens. Here's your divine moment. Here's a way for God to speak maturity in our lives so that people will come to know Jesus. We are not better than anybody else. We are just people that have been transformed by the one who can change everybody else. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of what? That is every person's fear. I never met in my subjective world. Oh, just never met my subjective world as a pastor. And there's pastors in this room. I've never met anybody who wasn't afraid to die. What's the old country song? Y'all country people, y'all know what I'm saying. You know, well, I mean, you're from Landrum, but, you know, you're Lamar. The, oh, the L's are together. Y'all are like L squared. Um, everybody wants, it's the old beer drinking song, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Not today. Oh, we all want to go to heaven. I can't wait to see Jesus. I just love him. Oh, we all want to go to heaven. I love him. You want to die right now? No, not really. Now, I've prayed for rapture. There's a difference between rapture and dying. Everybody agree with that? Rapture means, ha ha, I'm here and now I'm not. That's kind of cool with that. There's no pain, there's no suffering. I go into the table prepared before me in Psalm 23. Jesus provides a buffet. I'm there. Sign me up. But we're all afraid to die. And you know, and you know, because all of you in this room, somebody has died. And it ripped your heart out. And Ecclesiastes says that he has placed eternity in your hearts. And that's why you scream against it. Your, your, your grandmother just died, right? But you, and you, we were talking about upstairs, right? You gave me permission to say this, but right? Because as she just died, right? And, and you were there. And yet there was this fear. You could feel the sense of death. You could feel the spirit of death, right? You can feel it. You can feel the heaviness, the thickness, even smell death. Am I right? You know I'm right. But then there's joy. Oh, my, my, I go back to my dad's death in 2005. We were standing around him. My family's watching online. We're standing around him. We're praying. My oldest brother is holding his pulse. Paul says, oh, but, oh, it's a weird, horrible feeling. But there was something transformational that happened. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me at that moment to the best that I could understand him in my spirit. And he said, Psalm 116, 15, John. I said, what? He said, and they asked me to pray. 
They asked me to pray as he was dying. And I prayed Psalm 116. I, I, immediately Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. Let me say it again. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. Psalm 116, 15. And then the Holy Spirit took me to Acts chapter 7. Oh, Nick Ballinger, Pastor Ballinger, you better get me right on this. Oh, Acts chapter 7. The Holy Spirit took me right there. And you know, Marsh, you know, Ron, you know, Pastor Steve. The list goes on in this room. You know, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was dying, he looked up. And who was standing? Who was standing? Hmm. That's weird. Hebrews 12 tells me that's not the position Jesus is in. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and set down at the right hand of God. Jesus said at the cross, it is finished. Why does Jesus go from seated to standing? I want you to know something. When somebody comes in the room and I'm getting ready to greet them, I stand up. When you and I are dying, Jesus will be standing up to greet us because he is Lord over death, not death. Death is not a grave. It is a doorway to Jesus. Read John 21 when he said, Peter, you're going to die this way. Read it. The living word of God. You're going to die this way. And that's how you're going to bring glory to me. My earthly father taught me how to die. You, I, can teach people how to die. That teaches and speaks to everybody in this world. Why do people work out? I like the dopamine. I work out all the time. Look at me. I look like a busted can of biscuits. Nothing has ever changed. You've been to Walmart. You've seen the busted can there in, in that little dairy thing, and you're like, ooh, trashy. That's what people say about me. Why do people run all the time? I just can't wait to run. I just love that little sick feeling right there. It's right in my throat. I don't throw up, but it's right there. I love getting my heart rate up to 285, though the max is 220. Why do we eat right? Okay, I don't eat right. But why do some people eat right? Why do we pay medicine so much money? Can I get a witness? These people don't want to die. And you know it. You asked us to pray for you for that condition, didn't you? You had to be a little afraid, didn't you, when they told you you might have heart surgery, didn't you? When is the pair singing a song? We're supposed to have heart surgery. Not everything's what you think. People are afraid. And you know it, and I know it. But there was a Kairos moment when my dad died. Even though I felt the sting of death, I didn't feel the weight of it. Because Jesus took Held in slavery. You're held in bondage. Look what it says. Verse 14. So that by his death, by Jesus' death, we are buried with Christ in baptism. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, but yet I what? Live, not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. You want to be mature? 
Let the fear of the Lord be greater than the fear of death, and you will speak the gospel to everybody. People are afraid. That's why everybody's angry at the root of it. It's sin. Only, only righteous anger that comes in the bubble of love. Notice Jesus. Every time he was angry, he never got outside of love. He never got outside of love because he's the one who defines love. But, but people who are ungodly, when they get angry, they go outside of love and it goes to abuse. Look at Lamech in Genesis chapter 4. Abuse. He might break the power of him who is the him, he's going to explain, who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Satan is the orchestrator of death and darkness and darkness, and darkness, and the weight of heaviness. And so, when we are spiritually mature, we walk into the room, and we know who the real enemy is. There's a difference between us and a five-year-old. Five-year-old can walk into a room and realize something might be wrong. But we, who are older, can walk into the room and say, parents have been fighting. Maturity identifies the problem. You know it, and I know it. Tell the truth, shame the devil, we're afraid. But he breaks the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those. That's why we celebrate Juneteenth. Thank you, Nick, for putting that on there. And I know that was dear to your heart because of your son. And I love you for that. Because you and I both know as pastors and all the other pastors in this room that God wants his people free. And death absolute a man will do anything isn't that what isn't that what satan said to god about job come on you should be your holy spirit should be taking you to job any man will give his life right he'll do anything to save his life and what satan said to god where you been satan in job oh, he he says to god i've been roaming the earth why because peter tells us seeking those whom he may devour. And our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But if we are going to be mature and be the field is white with harvest, he says, but God is looking for workers. And so to me, I don't know if it's always a number problem, Kevin. I think sometimes it's a spiritual maturity problem. Because God says that he'll produce 30, 60, and 100 fold, which means he could take a little and give a whole lot. He could take a five loaf and a two fish and feed 5,000. What could he do with us in this room and online if we really became a church on fire? And free those all their lives who are held, Greek word, subject. all enslaved by the subject by the fear of death and why because Isaiah 59 verse 2 says it best but your iniquities come on some preachers in the room but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God can I just read Isaiah 59 to just the first part of that verse a little one more time but your iniquities your wickedness, right, your wickedness, John's wickedness has made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not what? 
Now, before you think I just went Old Testament prophet, let's go to James chapter 2, verse 10. James 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just what? I didn't hear you. What? That's why he said for the wages of sin, not the wages of sins. It is not plural in the Greek. It is a hundred to pass the test to be in the presence of God, not 99.9. If I gave you a brownie, my kids know this, I tell it all the time. If I gave you a brownie and it was 5% poop and 95% Duncan Hines, would you eat it? Me, if I'm hungry, probably. My kids are like, yeah, I would. I'm like, would you really? Yeah, I would. Would you? If I was like Emerald on the cooking show and I'm just sprinkling poop into a brownie and you walk in and I say, doesn't it smell so good? Would you? Well, John, it was a half truth. That's still a lie. Would you like for me to, to give you half the truth? Would you like for me to look at my wife, Lynette, and say, Lynette, you're number one in my life. I love you more than Judy, Jesse, and I don't know other names. You would say, John, that's terrible. Because she doesn't want to be number one. She wants to be the only one. Fear of death. This is why we feel fear of death. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty. That's the same word as held in slavery. The exact same word in the Greek as we see in there in ch uh, chapter 2. We see the same verse 15. And he says when held in slavery, guilty here is that that is why we're fearful. Because we know and the world knows something isn't right. But there's power in the blood. You can come play with me. I started thinking about this. I, 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 first, first, let me tell you what I went to. First, I started thinking about the verse because I was listening to John Piper, and he quoted this verse as he was doing a prayer walk or something, and he says, the verse, and y'all know this. I, I, Marcia, you want to tell me somebody can play, by the way? I just want to, I'm, she's going to be mad at me for saying this. You ought, to hear, you ought to hear her play. She's got this, like, really nice piano. It's like a mini one. And, and so I was sitting there, and, you know, I had to learn to read music. I'm not like you, you know. And so she's playing. I'm at her house. She's playing. And I was like, wow. She can play. And I'm turning the thing. She's like, I'm, I'm talking, reading, reading the music. Not me, like, playing A. Playing A in A sharp or an A minor or an A fifth. You know, not, not, like, she's reading it. And I started thinking, and it was hymns. She thought, it's hymns. Am I right? Am I right on that more? And I started thinking about this hymn. Crown him the Lord of life. This is verse 2. Who triumphed over the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing. Who died and rose on high. Who about lost and started crying. Who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. Crown him with many crowns. And then all I could think about was the next hymn, The Power of the Blood. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Now I'm not going to sing that high note because it'll get really bad. But he does say, oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. How? How do we move from feeling devoured by death to Holy Spirit empowered? By the way, I just want to tell you, I have not even really gotten my notes. This Holy Spirit just, I, I, I try to prepare. But the Holy Spirit speaks so fast sometimes, I can't keep up. So 
of y'all know my game, you've seen me on Facebook this week asking spiritual questions. Y'all saw me, and y'all know my game. To you, who is Jesus? I get responses. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Next day. The next day, if you would die tonight, where would you go and why? Or if you were to go meet Jesus, or if your life is over, where would you go and why? And there was this lady who I knew she, in, the, in the church I grew up in. I asked the second day, I said, do you believe in heaven and hell? She said this. She said, you know, I wish there were more sermons about heaven and hell like there were when I were a kid. And I believe I understand what the Holy Spirit was saying to her that spoke to my heart was John. The reason why we see people falling away, right, Pastor Nick, is because they've never been wrecked over their sins. They've never been wrecked that their sins put God on the cross. They've never, and you know, they want the love of God, but they don't want to really embrace that Jesus embraced the wrath of God. Everybody's fearful. We create images, strength, Money, position, academics. I've got all these degrees. That's a smoke screen. Smoke and mirrors. Behind it is a frayed person. Because one day, death comes. How are we going to be mature? How are we going to stand under the weight? You know, because y'all are singing mercy, and I just want that song makes me want to fall out. How do we, how are we mature? The notes are all on Facebook, but I want you to give it to you now. We need to walk like this. And I'm going to ask you, do you need to ask God today? I pray God floods this place. Y'all are like, what do you, why do you give a, John, is this for salva salvation? No, this is for transformation. Let's get as close in the physical as we can to the supernatural and let God transform us. And as a church family online in here, let's ask God to do verse 14. Let's ask him, let's ask him, let's ask him since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break. He might break the power. And I want you to know that Greek word power, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that Satan had authority. Only God has authority. Read Job. Do you need God to break something in you? Tell the truth. So that that could be broken, whatever it is, unforgiveness. Anger at God because you don't have what the wicked have. Frustration. Whatever it is that needs to be broken, do we need to ask him? Look what he says there. He gives us there. And then in verse 15, he says, and free. Is there anybody in here that needs to pray for freedom? have any time. But you know that word for slavery is doulos. You know it. You know it. All the other ones that know Greek, you know it's doulos. They were held in slavery. But then Paul in Romans uses that word, doesn't he? And takes us all the way back to Leviticus where we become willing slaves with the, with the all and we put our earlobe next to the door frame and they drive the little piece of wood into the, to the earlobe. It says, I, I could have left my master, but he's so good, I won't. I love him so much, I willingly say yes. I mean, do, do we need to be free in the love of God? Where we can swim in it where we can go deep in it, where we can embrace ourselves. So do I need to be broke? Does something need to break in my life? 
The answer to me personally is yes. God's got to break some things in me. I feel like there's sins that hold me back. Now we sing the song, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Not really. Break free, and then chapter 3, verse 1. Here's the big one for me. The other are all big. But Hebrews 3, verse 1. If you want application, what needs to be broken, when I look at my life, am I walking in freedom? Am, am I leading my family well? Am, are we walking in the freedom of Christ? Am I unashamed when I pray over the food? Am I, am, I, am I excited for my children to see me on my knees? Am I excited for people to see me with my Bible? Am I unashamed of the gospel? Jesus said, you're ashamed of me in front of men? I'm ashamed in front of you in front of the Father. So we know there's conditional grace in that in the sense that Christians will never be ashamed of God. We'll be convicted by it. Chapter 3, verse 1. Here's why we land the plane. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly, that's why the therefore was there, who share in the heavenly calling. What's the next word? Share in the heavenly calling. What's the next word? Fix what? You want to be spiritually mature? You want, you want, so when my dad was dying, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. Fix your thoughts. Here's Psalm 116, 15. Here's Jesus standing to meet his people. Precious in the eyes of the Lord of the death, the eyes of God. The eyes, listen, all, all, all you need is Tommy Tenney said is a nod from God. He doesn't even have to speak if he just looks. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. Remember that number six, the priestly blessing? Make his face shine upon you and give you peace. All you need is if God looks your way, whoo. If God just looks your way, land and he looks your way, and he's your front and rear guard, and he's already gone before you. Uh, we read up there in Hebrews 2, he's the pioneer of our faith. That means he's gone before us. He's your rear guard, and that's that bright and shining light. All of a sudden, man, there's this bright light around you, and then all of a sudden, there's this sweet, saint, godly woman, and she looks at you and goes, Wow. Where did he come from? Because that beautiful bright light of God is all over you. So she sees the beauty of Christ in you. Not that you're not beautiful. You are. But if it comes at a different magnitude. Is there anybody in here that needs to pray something to be broken over their family and friends? Or at work? If the Christians don't pray for it, it ain't going to happen. We're the Christians. So we, we, always, we don't have to pray for ourselves always. We, we pray for others. You know, we've got some prayer requests on text. We've been praying for people. Here's a good time to pray. God, break this. God, set this free. Uh, God, fix my thoughts on you. Do you need to fix your thoughts on Jesus? Why not just recenter? I love you. Thank you for letting me preach the whole gospel. And not just the gospel of psycho positivity, which I call psycho babble. Because I want you to know all of Jesus. He is loving and kind and good, but he is holy. And I should reverently, with humility, James said. of death is not in this room. If he breaks it, if we're free, we pray. Right? We're free. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. If you're not a believer, the only hope you have is Jesus. Your works will never do it. That is why other false religions who live by works live in bondage. Because they never know what's enough is enough. Mother Teresa or not? Is this a good person or not? 
no, Jesus is our no. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, do we need to fix our thoughts on you? Is there anybody in this room right now that just wants to come forward and say, God, I, I, need, to, I need to fix my thoughts on you over this? Is there anybody? Anybody online need to kneel right now? What is it? Is there anybody, Lord, right now that needs to ask God to break something over them and their family? Anybody? Is there anybody? Do you, do you feel heaviness at your house? You, you, you're walking in spiritual maturity? You're walking in, a, is, is there anything that needs to be broken at work? Is it broken over, uh, you feel like, because Jesus breaks every curse. It doesn't matter if your parents were in this bondage and you're worried about, well, they did this and they did this and I might have this. Oh, Jesus breaks all the curse. Is there anybody want to come right now while I'm praying? It's not unholy, Lord. You're, you're asking us to come. You said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's for believers, too. We as a church, is there anybody here that needs to ask God to break the, the spiritual heaviness around them so we can share the gospel? Anybody wants to just call upon the name of the Lord? Call upon him while we can still be found. Anybody? Is there anybody that needs freedom? I'm talking to the believers in the room and online. Anybody needs freedom? Does anybody need an Isaiah 55 moment where you can come to the one who will give you without cost and fill you? Is there anybody in this room, can we be a church that's absolutely broken in this holy moment for people? Is there anybody, Lord, I cry out to you to save people around me, my neighbors. I cry out to you to break the bondage over anybody in this church that's trapped in, in heartache and pain and suffering. Or, or they're, they're in a, uh, they've gone into a relationship from a bad relationship and they feel like that's going to come with them. Or maybe their parents or no parents. Or maybe they don't have it. Lord, all that's been broken in Jesus, but we're asking you to fix our thoughts on you. To, we got to reset our mind on you. Lord, we reset our mind on you in academics and, and, and money and, and finance and in career and future and in retirement and our, of our children and grandchildren. We're asking you to fix our thoughts. And we can't just wait for you to show up. You've asked us to show up because you're in us. Lord, there's so many people that don't know Jesus and there's, people are so afraid to share. We're held in fear. Lord, I'm asking, is there anybody who would just pray? that we become a church that are not, not, not afraid to share the gospel. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but us who are being saved is the power of God. And if there's anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus, I just want you to know the only answer and the hope. If, you don't, if you've never been born again, you're not saved, you know, then God's tugging at your heart. You need to get up out of your seat right now. You need to come down right now and grab Nick, grab somebody. I don't know. Grab somebody. We want to talk to you. And I know you're feeling weird. I know it's a weird feeling. I know you're white knuckling the seat right now. You're like, I'm not getting up. I'm not going to, I'll talk to him later. I'll talk to him after worship. What? The Spirit of God is already calling. Don't grieve the voice of the Lord. Father, is there anybody online that needs Jesus that can call out, Jesus, save me. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, you arose. And now that my debt has been paid, I follow you. I repent. I turn and follow you. Lord, will you? They just received the greatest gift of mercy ever. Would you let them come and tell us, Lord, is there anybody in this room that needs, please, God? Raise up workers. We are desperately crying to you. And only you can move in people's hearts. I cry out to you, Lord. The field is white with harvest, but the workers are few. Would you raise up people and say, I'll be a worker and I'll say yes. I'm coming forward and I say yes. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to Jesus. I believe in his mercy. I believe in his grace. Break it. Fix it. Turn our eyes. We love you. God, we bless you. We praise you. You are worthy and you are merciful. And like the song they're getting ready to sing, better put a bounce in our step. That Lord, by the power of you, there's not a demon in hell or Goliath on earth that can stop Jesus.
or his church. In Jesus' name.